Okay, fantastic. I think we should be good to go. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're doing super duper well today. Um, so today we have a session with Rami Ismail. Rami is a, a consultant, game developer. He has made a ton of games and he's been helping out the MENA region as a whole. And uh, generally anyone that's interested in uh, game development for quite a while now. Uh, so today he's going to be giving us the first business session, the first of two, and we're going to be talking about pitching your game to investors. Uh, so Rami, if there's anything you'd like to add, and if you'd like to get started, you know, the floor is yours. No, that sounds about right. That sounds perfect. Yeah, let's talk about the business part of video games. I'm sure you've been um, working on your games or working in the uh, in the program on uh, creating games. I'm sure many of you have done games in the past before or um, know in general how to make a video game. And, you know, that's part of why you're part of this program is to improve. Um, as we go, a few things um, to sort of discuss. As we go, um, I am in uh, Puerto Rico on the other side of the planet where the internet can be a little spotty sometimes. So if I suddenly like drop for a bit, sorry, um, I, I can't help that part. Um, the, um, the second thing is if at any point during this entire presentation, you have any questions at all, feel free to just um, put them in chat. Um, I will be reading chat as we go um and i'll be um i'll be happy to answer questions there um i might also ask you questions in which case same thing just please answer in the chat uh, it just helps me get a bit of a better idea of um what you are up to and what you all are uh, are doing so um my favorite color is blue uh, adam um it is uh, more like um, a darker blue a water blue not a sky blue um so yeah um Let's get going. As money, um, making games costs money, um, and running a studio costs money. Um, and if you're making games as a as a hobby or as a student, is not as important uh, as when you are doing it commercially or when you're doing it as a job. And uh, I'm, I myself am I'm half Egyptian. I know the feeling of your parents wanting you to have a real job, uh, the, the job that they can brag about to uh, to the uncles and aunties. Um, so, you know, uh, proving that you can make money with games is actually a fairly big part of convincing your parents that there is a real job here. So uh, actually, that ended up being a really big um, advantage. And just to tell a quick story before we get started, but when I started independent game development back in 2008, 2009, most of the developers in the indie scene, and there were only 100 indie devs maybe like globally, um, most of them were either from the United States or they were British or Canadian. Uh, that was most of them. There was a bunch of them in Finland and there were obviously a bunch of them um, around the world, um, but most of them were in those places. And um, all of them were very artistic people. They were all people that were um, students that didn't really need money. And all of them said like, oh no, we're doing it for the art. We're doing it for the for the culture. We're doing it as, as counterculture. We're punk rock. But I was, I was Egyptian. And my dad would say, Yerami, you need a real job. Khalas bin Nintendo. Like, go, go and you know, become a, doc a doctor, uh, uh, you know, engineer, become become a lawyer, like become any of those things. You're a smart kid. What are you doing? Like, why are you playing on the Nintendo? And with that thought in mind, I was one of the, because of that, I was one of the first indies that took the business of independent game development really seriously. Like I wanted to earn money with my games because I wanted to prove to my dad that this was a real job. And that is actually probably part of why I'm talking to you today. It's because I was one of the one of the first people that said, like, no, I, art is cool, but I can't tell my dad. I can't tell my dad that you know I'm I'm not only playing Nintendo, I'm also playing Nintendo as an artist. Like I'm just he's just gonna, you know, A, the amount of ship ships he'll throw will be endless, and then B, I will have to leave the house. So um I I basically went um and 
ended up uh, doing the business uh, part of, of game development seriously. And that is part of what got me my reputation of, of being the business person in independent games. Um, early in 2011, 2012, um, the, um, the word for a business person in indie games was just a Rami, like just a Rami. People wanted a Rami in their video game company to do the business. So, you know, in a way, my, my heritage there helped, but I do know the pressure of, hey, we need to also make money with this because otherwise it's going to be relatively hard to, to maintain what we're doing. So part of what I want to talk about is like, how do we turn this game development thing into a job, into a career, into a business? Um, and for most of you, we're talking about starting your own studio or working in a team or a smaller team um, to um, to build that. Now, the first things first, we're just going to zoom out all the way. And there's two ways I can do this. A, we can keep it a bit more of a, of a conversation. Yani, you will just talk. Or B, we can do a bit more of a presentation, which means I'll talk. Is there any preference? Any Anybody who's just like, okay, you know what? Let's keep it a little casual or let's do the full presentation. What do you all want? Uh, raise of hand for conversations. You guys know how to raise hands, right? With your actions. We did it yesterday. So. I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know how to raise hands. Um, okay, some people would like a presentation. Others would like a conversation. Oh, God. Yeah, democracy. Hello, let's see more. I see more presentation than... Um... The conversation. So we'll 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 do the presentation, and then if there is time left, we'll do. Uh, awesome. We'll do some of the other stuff too. Let me grab the presentation. Because there's parts that I want to talk about with you. Parts of the of the the, um, the presentation. Parts of my presentations are just like different per audience. So we're gonna we're gonna veer off and on. I'm actually probably gonna jump between some different presentations for y'all as we go. Um because I think there's just stuff that is unique about where we live and where we are that uh, changes the way we should look at these things. Um let me see if I can share screen. Share screen. Uh presentation. Close. Are you all seeing this? Yes, entrepreneurship. Good, awesome. So what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about the first part of this all the way up to pitch, okay? The rest of it, we're going to leave for another time. But we're going to talk about this part up to pitch. And then I'll give a different presentation about purely how to structure a pitch. But before we talk about, about the pitch, before we talk about how to make a pitch, I think it's important that we all understand why we're doing a pitch and um, what it actually means to a pitch, because uh, that is actually a bit more complicated than most people think. So let's zoom all the way back out. Let's go all the way back to the start. And let's talk about what a business is, right? What, what, what does it mean to have a business? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur, right? So entrepreneur is somebody who takes risks. Halas, that's it. There's, there's nothing more to it. There's nothing more complicated to it. All that it is, is that you are somebody who takes risks in the hope of making money, making more money than you're spending. That's it. It's not more complicated than that. Yeah, there's a million ways of running a business. There's a million ways of doing a business. But in the end, it always comes down to managing your risk. That's the, that's the whole game. And because of that, risk is also the lens through which we're going to look at most of the things we're going to be talking about. There's two parts, two lenses, your risk and your opportunity, right? The opportunity is the amount of money you could make, and the risk is the amount of money you could lose. And we're just going to look at everything through that lens. Now, at heart, I'm a programmer. I'm a game designer. I love the art of games. But at some point, I have to stop being those things, take a step back and look at it through this lens to make sure that I can continue to run a company. So when we're talking about anything, we're going to look at it through the lens of risk. What kind of risk are we creating for ourselves? And is that going to harm our company? What kind of opportunity are we creating for ourselves? And is that going to help our company? Now, one of the primary ways of managing risk is by setting realistic and sustainable goals. 
realistic and sustainable so not just you know like uh, i want to be uh, i want to make the next minecraft or i want to make the next uh, among us no no realistic sustainable goals and your goals of course they can be ambitious of course they can be big they just can't be ridiculous right because i come across a lot of developers who say I, you know i want to be ea i want to make minecraft i want to make among us i want to make fall guys and when you're starting out and where most of you are honestly you, your goals should generally be to make a game right just make a game ship it get it out there put it on steam put it on iphone put it on android put it out there and do it without losing money without losing money now that's hard enough that's hard enough because trying to do something like this costs money making games costs money spending time costs money the opportunity cost of making a game is fairly high. You're probably three, four, five, six, eight, ten people. All of them are not taking a salary, you're only taking part of a salary, right? Um, and that's really hard. To answer the question, hang on, how is making Among Us unreasonable? asks uh, Yunu. Um, it, making a game like Among Us is fairly, it's fairly straightforward. Making a thing that will take off and be successful and be there at the right time, at the right place, that goes viral, like what, two and a half years after launch? For the first two and a half years, that game was not successful at all. I know the developers, they were really sad about how poorly it did. And then when COVID happened, it just blew up, right? So um, Among Us, it's it's not an easy game, per se. It's not an easy game. It's It's a fairly complicated game, network games, per definition are not easy games to make, right? Um, but, um, and the balancing of the playtesting that was in there that kind of allowed it to work was not easy. It's not an easy game to make. If you think Among Us is an easy game to make, you're overestimating how easy it is to, to make a game. Like it is hard to make something like Among Us. Is it impossible? No. Is it likely that you're gonna be as successful as them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, because pretty much everybody wants to make a game like that. I want to make a game like that, and I'm probably not going to succeed in making a game like that, right? A game that successful. Um, so we'll continue from there, but the short version is Among Us is not as easy as it seems. It looks easy, it isn't. Networking makes it complicated immediately, um, but you could, you could, you could do it. When I say without taking a loss, I also do count. Um, I do count the um, the opportunity cost. So I do count the salary you're not earning because you're doing this instead of getting a job, right? That's that's I am counting that. So you want to make up for the amount of money you spent, preferably. Now this is your goal. You don't have to. You don't have to perfectly hit this goal, but this is a really good goal. If you can set this goal for yourself, that's hard enough. Making a game is hard enough. Shipping a game is even harder. And then doing it without taking a loss is very hard. Very hard. If you don't have a reputation yet, if you don't have a fan base yet, if you don't have contacts in the press yet, you don't have contacts with streamers yet, just doing this goal is going to be extremely difficult for you. Right? So that's what we're going to set for our goal. It is higher than what is probably possible, but it is good to have goals that are ambitious. It is good to have goals that are beyond your reach, because if you set your goals within your reach every time, you're never going to grow. You're never going to get better, right? So we're going to set the goal fairly high. Now, this might be lower what you were thinking. Maybe you were thinking, I want to get a lot of fans. Maybe you were thinking, I want to make a lot of money. Maybe you were thinking... Um, I want to be famous or I want to win awards or I want to get a, a BAFTA or a GDC award or any of those things. Let's forget about all of those things. For now, let's make a game and ship it without taking a loss. And then after we succeed with that goal, we continue to make games. At that point, our company switches entirely, our business switched entirely. We've shipped the game now. We've proven we can do it. And now we change the company from focusing on one game we start focusing on all the games that come after it. We start focusing on the brand, on what the company means, on the fan base, on the community. But until we get to shipping a game, 
we have to prove that we could ship it him first. It doesn't make sense to try and build all these things if we can't know that we can ship a game yet. That it doesn't mean you can't build a community yet, you can't work on marketing yet, but what is important is that we focus first on making that first game. Okay. So your goal is to make a game. And you're going to make that game by working with game designers and game artists and developers and game specialists, games technology. We're going to work with game engines and games press and games media. And what are we going to do? What are we going to sell? What is the thing we are going to make to hit that goal of making a game and shipping it without taking a loss? Well, your answer might be a video game, right? But that's not the right answer because if we do a video game, the risk is very high. We're going to spend two years making a game and then we're going to flip a coin and see if it works out. That's too risky for any company. What we're going to do is we're going to sell the business case. The business case, what that is, we're going to talk about it right now. But the reason we do that is because if we can sell the business case, then somebody else will pay for development. And if you want to do development, having somebody else pay for it reduces your risk. Now, there's two ways of doing business, just two ways. The first one is you maximize your opportunity. You try to earn as much money as possible. And the second one is you minimize your risk. You try to lose as little money as possible, preferably none at all. Now, th these two ways of doing business, everybody in the industry has their own strategy and it's slightly different, but really every strategy comes down to, okay, we're trying to make more money or we're trying to lose less money. And even companies that are very successful might be minimizing risks. And even companies that are not very successful might be maximizing opportunity. Success has nothing to do with which of these two you take. It does have to do with when you take either strategy. So when you're starting out, obviously, you're going to be focusing on minimizing risk. You don't have money to lose. If you lose the money, you're out of a job. Halas, it's done. You go and you, you work somewhere. I don't know where you go work, but you go work in, in you know, like family business or if in, a, in an office or you go, you, go, you go out of games, right? That would be a shame. So what we're going to do is we're going to not lose money. We're not going to go into debt. We're not going to get a mortgage. We're not going to, what we're going to do is we're going to manage the risk. We're going to manage the risk in a smart way. Because there's still risk. Of course, there's still risk. The risk is your time. You're spending a year and a half, two years of your life on this project. That's, that's risky. If you think about it, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 35. I'm 35. And every game I make takes two to three years to make. Right? Two to three years. That means I have maybe 10 games left in me before I have to retire. Just 10 games. That's it. No more. Just that. That's a huge risk. Every game I take removes one of the 10 games I have left to make. Then I only have nine left. And if it takes longer, if it takes three years, five years, and I have even fewer years, I might only have four games left to make. Right? And then I have to retire. Then I'm old. You know, like it's, it's a hard job, game development. You can't do it forever. So you're always taking risk. The question, though, is can we move the risk from you, most of the risk from you, to somebody else? And that's what we're going to do. And how we're going to do it is we're going to move it away from us to somebody else, to somebody who can take that risk better than we can, the financial risk better than we can. We're going to move that risk from us to them as soon as possible. And that's what we call funding. So funding isn't just getting money. It's not about the money. Funding is about moving the risk. And usually you do that with money, but sometimes you can get a really good deal a funding deal that doesn't involve you actually getting money. It just involves somebody else paying for your job or it involves somebody else hiring you. It involves like that is all risk. When you're a freelancer, you can mitigate risk by working with somebody that promises to hire you for a year. That lowers your risk, right? So as soon as we can move that funding, that, that risk away from us, we're funded. So if you go and you go to your, your uncles and your aunties and your, and your parents and, and friends of the family and you get money from them, but you have to pay the money back, that's not funding. That's a loan. The risk is still with you. If you don't succeed, you still have to pay, pay these people back, right? If you get a mortgage to fund your game, 
the risk is still with you. You take a loan with the bank, the risk is still with you. Those are not funding, those are loans. The risk stays with you. If the risk moves to somebody else who's now paying for the game, but in exchange, <clears throat> if the game does well, they make money. If the game does poorly, they lose money. Then the risk has moved away from you. That's funding. And that's what we want to talk about today because that's what pitching is about. And the problem is the game doesn't exist yet. You haven't made it yet because if you had made it already, you've already taken the risk. So we're trying to move it as soon as possible. We're trying to do it before the game exists. And that means we're going to be selling a promise. That promise, that is the business case. And the thing you really need to know about this promise is that the value of a promise like that is speculative. What does speculative mean, right? Speculative means that the value is zero. The value is zero. There is no value yet, it's zero dollars. But people can speculate about how much it will be worth later, right? People can say, okay, in, in, a, in, a, in a year, in two years, this game is gonna be worth this amount of money. Right. And if you can convince anybody to give you any money, then that becomes the value of the thing, of the game, of the business case. So the business case worth is zero. But if somebody gives you a million dollars for it, then the value is a million. If somebody gives you 10 million for it, the value is 10 million. If somebody gives you a hundred thousand dollars for it, the value is a hundred thousand. So the value is made up. Whatever anybody gives you for it, that is the value. That is the value, right? But that makes it really hard because we have nothing. We only have our promise and your promise is probably not worth all that much at the moment, right? That is with experience, with more games shipped, your promise becomes worth more. But right now, it is not worth much. So we're going to go from here and we're going to look at how we make a business case and how we create that value. And how do you pick a game? How do you choose what games to make? Well. To choose your game, you forget about the business, right? You forget about the business. I have found every time I try to make a game from a business point of view, I did terribly. Whenever I try to do market research or um, figure out what kind of a game I had to make based on the games that are available on the market now, it didn't go well. You know why it didn't go well? It makes a lot of sense. If you do research now and it takes two years to make a game, by the time your game is done, it's no longer going to be the thing people like, right? When you think about it, when you think about the games that have been really successful, right? In 2016, it was, uh, I think it was Overwatch, right? If you started working on a game right then, and you wanted to make a game of the year game, you wanted to make the game that was the biggest game of the year, and you, and you were inspired by Overwatch, and it took two years to make a game, your game would have come out in the year of God of War, right? You would have been in completely the wrong place for that year. That year was really big on single player, like big epic stories. That was what most of what was happening, right? If you were inspired by God of War to make a game, and it took two years. Well, then you would be launching in, what was it? Probably the game of, I don't remember what the biggest game of 2020 was. It was not God of War, I can tell you that. Um, but you would be hitting way more in the in the year of, was that Among Us? That was the year where Among Us really got big, maybe. Uh, Hellblade, Fortnite, stuff like that, right? Like whatever you take, Whatever year you pick, if you look two years later, you're not going to be right. You're never going to be right because the business, the market moves too fast. It moves too fast. So market research, yes, it's useful for some things, but what it's not useful for is for picking what game you want to make, which game you should make. Now, the way you pick the game you should make is you dream what game should exist. What idea are you missing in games? What are you seeing? What are you? What do you feel you want to make, right? It's not a business. This is the creative part. The business goes around the creative part, right? So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you stop thinking about budgets or timelines or whatever, anything. You just think of the game you sh that should exist. Game that should exist that you believe that you have the ability to make. And honestly, when you think about it, all these big companies, right? The Blizzards, Activisions, the EAs, the Ubisoft, all of these companies, they spend millions of dollars on market research. 
millions of dollars on market research, on sentiment analysis, on um, um, sales data, on um, analytics, on all that stuff. And even they can't predict where the market is going, right? They just do it by gut feeling. Which games are going to work has nothing to do with data. It has everything to do with people making creative chances, taking creative risks. So in the creative part, I want you to just do what you want to do. The business part, we're going to have to figure out how to sell that. That's the hard part. Okay. So let's go from there. You've got a dream. You've got a dream. You've got this idea. Now I want you to start prototyping. Prototyping. When I say prototype, and this is a thing I see in many countries where I travel, right? Not just in Mina, but everywhere. Not just in the Arab world, but everywhere. Wherever I go, prototype. People think prototyping means it has to be good. It has to look good. It has to play well. It has to, no, 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 no. None of this nonsense. None of that nonsense. I want your prototype to be so bad, to program so poorly that your programmer will cry at it at how bad the code is, right? I want your prototype to be made so fast that you do it in two weeks, in one week. Whatever your mechanic is, you can prototype it in two weeks. You can prototype most mechanics in two weeks, right? People spend too much time to write the code well, to make the art good, to make it look good, to make it feel, no, 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 no. Just make it work. Point of prototype is to test. It's not a demo, Ya Muhammad. A prototype is not a demo. A prototype is a test for yourself. So if you say, I want to make a fighting game, what you do is you prototype fighting mechanics. So you check whether you can do a punch, whether you can do a kick. And then you can prototype characters in the fighting game. But it is like, it is smaller than a minimum viable product, uh, Omar. It is, um, yeah, a minimum testable product is good. The smallest possible way to test it, the fastest way to test it, the, the, the dirtiest, fastest, quickest, ugliest way to test it. That's a prototype. And you want to prove to yourself that your mechanics will work. And we already prototype. You already prototype. If you do art, you don't start with the final image. You start with a sketch. That's a prototype, the quickest way of testing. When you write a story, you don't start by writing the full story. You, you start with a draft. That's a prototype. It's quick, it's dirty. You don't care about typos in a draft. You just write it, right? When you do music, you don't compose the entire thing. No, you start with a, with a chord or with, with a progression. And then you go from there, right? So we prototype the wrong way in video games. A lot of developers prototype the wrong way. They try to make everything good. No, 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 just test the thing you want to test. You want to test whether the jump is good? Then prototype just the jump. And then whether it's done, write down how you did it, delete the prototype. Colossus, we're done. We don't need it anymore. We don't need it anymore. Good prototypes, test, test, test. If it's good, you keep it. If it's bad, you throw it away. If it's almost good, you try again. And if you do that rapidly, if you do that fast, you'll make better games. That's it. There's an old story about, um, about a teacher who teaches pottery, right? Baking pots, clay pots made out of clay. And the story goes that he had a class and he split the class into one group who had to make a pot in the school year one pot in the school year they can make one pot in the school year that was it right but they could study as much as they want they could read about it as much as they want but as soon as they put a pot in the oven that was their pot that was the only pot they got to make the second one was the other group had to make a pot every day every day and only the last one would count but because they were making so many pots they wouldn't have time to study or to read or to prepare or to draw or to sketch or whatever they could only do the pots so at the end of the year they compared the people who made a pot every day against the people who made a pot once and who do you think made the better pots of course the people who made a hundred pots 
200 pots. They made the better pots because they get to try, oh, this is too much clay, not enough clay, too much water, not enough water. Heat, not enough heat. The people who made a lot of pots make better pots. The people who make a lot of prototypes make better prototypes. The people who make better prototypes make better games. So the longer you take about your prototype, the more time you're wasting, the more risk you're taking before you figure out what's good. It is always better to test faster. Spend less time on your prototypes. When you know everything works, then you can spend more time on it. But until that time, we prototype fast, we prototype dirty, we throw it away. We throw it away. We don't reuse the code. We don't write it to be modular. We don't make beautiful art. We don't write full stories. Absolutely not. You make quick, shitty things, bad things, things you would be embarrassed by. You make them quickly, you test them. If it works, you keep it. And then maybe the next time when you have everything figured out, <laughs> when you have more figured out, okay, then we'll make it properly. But you don't make it properly until you've tested that it's going to work. Why would you make something that you don't know is going to work? Why would you waste your time? So prototype quick, fast, set deadlines, one week, three days, right? Go fast. If you don't, if you can't stand not making something that is good, if you're too much of a perfectionist, you're not going to make it. That's it. That's all I can tell you. You're not going to make it in the games industry. If you can't get over your own perfectionism, it is not going to work. Because the games industry is a risky business, and we don't have time or money to let people spend three weeks on something that isn't going to be good. We don't have time to have a designer sit there and go, I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good. Inshallah, it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good. And then three weeks later, they try it, and it's bad. Would you rather have that designer on your team, or would you rather have the designer that after one day comes back and said, hey, I tested it. Actually, it's not good. Let me try something else. Which designer would you rather work with? Which programmer would you rather work with? Would you rather work with the programmer that sits down and goes, hey, let me, let me, just, let me just jam it out. It's going to be done in like an hour. We can test it. And then the code is off when they have to rewrite it, right? Or would you rather work with a programmer that takes two weeks and it's beautiful code and then you realize it's bad? The idea doesn't work. Of course, you'd rather work with people who are faster, right? So this is an important skill for you to learn, is to learn to do bad, bad work. Learn to do terrible work. Learn to do embarrassingly bad work with one purpose only. One purpose only, which is to test to learn, to improve, to grow, right? So you start prototyping. And I don't know how long this prototyping is going to take. You have your dream, you're going to prototype. And if, if the dream works, if the prototype works, if it comes together, and sometimes you have three prototypes, four prototypes, five prototypes. Sometimes you keep testing a bunch of time because it doesn't work, but you feel it's going to work, right? That's fine. But you don't spend too much time prototyping. So you prototype, you prototype, you prototype. And when it works, then let's do some business, okay? So let's talk about risk. Let's talk about opportunities. Let's talk about value. Let's go back to the business. We've talked the creative thing. I've said the most important thing I wanted to say about creative work, which is to prototype faster, to test faster. Let's go back to what that means for business. Because if we've moved fast, right, we can safely go to pitching. If we took a year and a half to get to this point, you're already in trouble. Because if nobody funds it, you just wasted a year and a half of your life. You've wasted one game of your life. You've wasted that time of your life. You're not going to earn the money that that time of your life was worth, right? So we're going to test fast. We're going to prototype fast so we can get to this point as fast as possible. As fast as possible. Now, here are your risks. Your risks in this industry is you have no money. You have a team with little experience and you have no reputation. Those are bad risks. Those are terrible risks. No money means you can't take money risks. No team experience means you can't take risks with your team, with your experience. No reputation means you have nothing to use. You have, it's just risk. All you have right now is risk. But also, it makes your opportunities really straightforward. Your opportunity is just to earn any money, grow a bigger team, become more experienced, get a better reputation. These are very easy, straightforward opportunities. In fact, 
for most of them, all you have to do is ship a game. You're at the start. You are at rock bottom. Yeah, you cannot get lower than here, except by getting a negative reputation or going into debt, right? But you can never become less experienced. So that one is clear. Making anything, if you make no money, you don't gain reputation, your team experience improvement is already automatic gain. So your opportunity is always upwards. You can't go down from here. You can only go up, right? Now let's talk about your value. What are you worth to other people, to other people in this industry? Well, your value is different per group, right? Your money is very important to you. Money is very important to you because that allows you to continue doing this without your mom and dad telling you to stop playing Nintendo, right? Um, so that's fairly important. Um, the money is also important to the audience. If you make them spend too much money for a game they don't think is worth it, they're not going to like you anymore. That's bad, right? Your team and experience, well, that's pretty straightforward, but that's mostly important to your partners, to your funding partners, to people that might invest in you, to Xbox, to PlayStation, to companies like that. For them, your team and your experience is actually the most important thing, more so than your money, more so than your reputation. If you have a very experienced team, but you're starting for the first time, you'll be fine. If you have, uh, if you have nothing but a team with lots of experience, you can get funded pretty easily. And finally, your reputation is important. Now, that one is mostly important to the audience because that's how they find you. But it's also important to your partners. They would rather work with a company with a good reputation than a company with a bad reputation. That makes sense, right? So your risks, your opportunities, and your value. Let's flip this around, right? Let's talk about the people that might give you money, the publishers, the platforms, things like that. Their risks, they're none of our business. That's their problem. The risks they take, that's not our problem. If they want to spend $10 million on your bad Pac-Man clone, Klaus, let them go out of business. Take the $10 million and, and walk away. It's not our job to do their job. Their job is to pick their games, pick their battles, publish the games that are going to make them money. If they make a mistake, okay. Not, not our fault, right? They accidentally give you too much money, okay. That's fine. We'll take the money, we'll walk away. That's not our job. Right. So let's talk about their opportunities because their opportunities <clears throat> are very different. Very different. They have structure and they have money. That's their resources. That's what they have. That's their strength. They don't have any of the other stuff. They don't have the creativity. They don't have any of that. All they have is money and structure. And the structure they use to simplify your life. They already have contacts with press, with influencers, with QA, with localization, with all of those things. And they have the money you need to make your game. And their way of money, of thinking about money, is a little, is a little weird. It's a little weird. Because they're not thinking about how much money they spend. That's not as important to them. They're, for them, all that's important is that when they spend money, they get back three times as much. Think about it this way. If I take uh, um, Ahmed over there, if I take Ahmed and I give Ahmed $10,000, I give Ahmed $10,000 and Ahmed makes me $30,000, right? If Ahmed makes me $30,000, I can give Ahmed another $10,000 and then hopefully Ahmed will make me another $30,000. That's beautiful. But now I can also go to Sara and give Sara $10,000. And if Sara makes $30,000 or $100,000 or $50,000, I take that money as well. And on the final $10,000, so I just keep that as profit. Now I've earned my money back. I've doubled the amount of games that I can publish. And I'm happy, right? Now here's the thing. If I have multiple of these things going on, I say I am funding Ahmed's game, I'm funding Sara's game, I'm funding Karim's game, Nabil's game, I'm funding like four or five games. Does it matter to me whether Ahmed's game is successful? It doesn't. Only partially, I would like it to be successful. But if Ahmed's game isn't successful, but Karim's game is, okay, we're good. Because I'm 3xing, I'm tripling or more as a goal. And if only a few of my games do that, in fact, only one in three games needs to do that, then I'm going to be good. So for Devolver Digital or Raw Fury, they don't need every game to be as successful. Because they can't. That's not how that works. You can't make sure that every game is successful. What you can do, 
is sort of say, okay, if we don't think the game will make three times as much money as that we're giving them, we're not going to fund them. But to them, it isn't important whether that's $100,000 that you want or a million dollars. That's not the, the important part. The important part to them is if they give you $100,000, are they going to make $300,000? They give you a million dollars, are they going to make $3 million? That's the only part that's important to them. So they look at money very different way. Very different way than we do. We look at money as a thing we spend. We go to the supermarket, we spend money. They don't look as money as spending. They look at giving money away as investment. If you understand that, a lot of what comes next becomes a lot easier to follow. So I hope everybody understands that. Okay? Everybody got that? All right. All right. Good. Come on. Good. Let's go. So here's what they do. What they are going to do is they're going to give you money. And here's what they're going to get in exchange. A, hopefully three times as much money. Hopefully three times as much money. But they get a few other benefits as well. For example, don't Google this one, okay? Who published, um, let's say, Cult of the Lamb? It was a really big game. Who published Cult of the Lamb? What was the publisher of Cult of the Lamb? Devolver Digital? I've seen Devolver Digital. Everybody agree? Is it Devolver Digital? Right. Devolver Digital. Awesome. Cool. What was the developer of Cult of the Lamb? Who developed it? You see what they're doing? The developers are our colleagues. Mass monster, yeah. The developer are our colleagues, right? Those are our friends. Those are our people. But we don't name, know their name. We don't know their name. Because what the, the, what the publisher does is they make sure that you just remember them. What they're doing is they're taking our audience and they're selling it back to us. That's their job. That's their job. That's important to them because they want to make sure that you, as a consumer, connect with them. And then they use that audience, the audience that we built, they use that to become more valuable. So Devolver Digital, there's lots of developers, lots of games that are Devolver Digital games. I have Devolver Digital games. Lufthrausers was a Devolver Digital game, right? Um, Denaton did Hotline Miami. Most people wouldn't know that, right? Like, so that's the thing. Publishers sell your game under their brand to grow their portfolio and their reputation, to grow their value for us so that they have more negotiation power. So not only are they trying to make money, but they're also trying to find these good games to connect to their names so that people think of their brand as a brand with good games. And Evolver, bless them, is very good at that, right? Because I remember, I was we were Devolver's first ever game. Devolver's first indie game was one of my games, Serious Sound the Random Encounter. We were one of the first published Devolver games. So I know Devolver when they were just three guys in a, in a house. That was it. That was all. That was not even 10 years ago. And back then, the name of Lambeer, my game studio, and the name of Devolver were equally powerful. But over the years, their name grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And now nobody remembers Lambeer the way they remember Devolver. Maybe some people that love Nuclear Throne, indie developers, the people that make games, the people that love game design, they remember Lambeer. But everybody remembers Devolver. That's their opportunity, right? So that's why they care about so much more than just the money, right? And they have one more opportunity, which is that they are super well connected. If you're a developer, once every two years, you ship a game. And when you ship a game, you have to contact the press, you have to contact the streamers, you have to contact the platforms, you have to contact everybody. And because you only can do it once every two years, and the rest of the year you're working on your game, it's really hard to keep those connections. So people leave their job, people focus on other things, people don't think of you when they're thinking about opportunities. Now, publishers, they're shipping 10, 12, 20 games a year. So they're continuously talking to the um, to the press. They're continuously talking to the platforms. They're continuously talking to Xbox, the idea at Xbox, the PlayStation, to Nintendo. So when something happens on that side, 
they can access those things. They can access those deals, those exclusivity deals. They can access subscription services. They can access funding options you didn't even know about. Did you know that PlayStation has a prototype funding when your game is still early in development and you're not quite sure it's going to work with? PlayStation can give you, if you do a good pitch, they can give you $25,000, no questions. You don't even have to pay it back. Average developer wouldn't know that, but the publishers do. And all they do when they when they sign your game is they'll turn around. They'll say, okay, you'll get $50,000. They'll turn around to PlayStation and go, hey, exclusivity deal, $100,000. And PlayStation will go, okay. And then they've made back their money before you've even started developing. Because they have access to this sort of deals because of our games. Because they have 10 of us, 20 of us working on games. Right? As individual developers, these things are much harder to get access to. But for publishers, these are their opportunities. So keep in mind, publishers benefit a lot from connecting games to them, but they think about games very differently than we do. They don't care about whether your game is good. That's not important to them. If it's good, yeah, obviously it's better, but does it fit? Does it fit their portfolio? Does it fit their brand? That's important. Does it look like it's going to make money? That's important. Those things are important to them. The game, it's just part of the equation, small part of the equation, right? Now, a lot of people ask me, what is, what is a big budget? What is a big budget, right? Because a lot of developers, especially from MINA, especially from MINA, but also Latin, Latin, Latin America um, and parts of Asia, you know, the economy in the Arab world is not great. In most of the Arab world, it's not great, right? Like, let's let's be honest. That means that gives us a benefit. It's a bad benefit. I'm not saying we should be happy about this. Like, I'm not saying we should be happy about this. But what I am saying is it means that our salaries are relatively low compared to the rest of the world, right? That means with less money, we can make more game. Now, that is a benefit. And then I see people from MINA from Lebanon, from, from Moss, I see them and they go and they pitch for $30,000 because that's enough money. So for a white $30,000, every other developer that would make that game would ask for 150 and you come in with $30,000. What is $30,000? It's a lot of money to you, but you can get five times as much and it will be the same thing. Let me give you an example, right? 181,000 employees work at Microsoft. That's Microsoft, right? Xbox, Microsoft, 181,000 employees. That's just the full-timers. That's not the contractors, not the freelancers, $181,000. Say that a lunch sandwich is $1. Just a normal sandwich, $1. That means that your game at $181,000 can be funded, can be funded, by just skipping lunch. If Microsoft skips lunch, they can fund your game. They can fund your game. Just one day of lunch. Not even and not even a big lunch. Just everybody skips their sandwich. If everybody skips their sandwich at Microsoft, they can fund your game. That's how little money is worth to these big companies. Right? So when you're thinking about funding your game, don't try to make it cheap. Don't try to go like, oh no, it's fifty thousand dollars. It's too much. It's fifty thousand. What is fifty thousand dollars for a company like that? Fifty thousand dollars is nothing for a company like that. It means nothing. In fact, you know how I teach people when they're doing video games. You know how I teach them to think about money. Imagine you are um, you're trying to buy something, and let's say it's dollars, right? Just to make it easy, you're trying to buy something. Say you're trying to buy a, a bottle of Coca-Cola. Bottle of Coca-Cola, let's say it's $2, right? It's $2. Now say you go back to the supermarket the next day and now it's two and a half dollars, $2.50. Are you still gonna buy the Coca-Cola? Let's say Coca-Cola everywhere becomes two fifty. It's not just that store, it's everywhere. It goes from $2 to $2.50. dollars you You still gonna buy the Coca-Cola? Probably still going to buy the Coca-Cola, right? It's 50 cents. Yeah, of course. Okay. Now say the Coca-Cola goes from $2, it goes to $3. 
You're still going to buy the Coca-Cola? I would still buy the Coca-Cola. If I'm thirsty, I'm still going to buy the Coca-Cola. Right? Let's say it goes from $2 to $5. Would you still buy the Coca-Cola? I probably would not buy the Coca-Cola. $5, mm -mm, that's too much. All right. Now here's how companies think about here's how companies think about business. Add five zeros to that. Okay? Add five zeros. Twenty thousand dollars. In fact, at uh, two hundred thousand dollars, right? Two hundred thousand dollars. We add five zeros. Two hundred thousand dollars and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars is the exact same amount of money to these companies. The exact same amount. The same way that to you, two dollars to two dollar fifty for a Coca Cola. The same thing because they work their entire brain works in hundreds and thousands it works in millions if you ever want to think whether a budget is too high or too low or whether a change is too much or not enough just add the five zeros remove the five zeros and think if you would still buy the coca-cola a three hundred thousand dollar budget or four hundred thousand dollar budget that's the same number i can guarantee you that's the same number i've worked with people in this chat where i've told them to raise the budget i've worked with teams that came in to my consultancy, and they told me two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we sold the game for seven million. That's how low they were. People are too low. People sit too low with their budget because they don't have confidence. They're not sure. They don't know whether they deserve the money. Your salary, how much you're spending, how much you cost, how much your work is is worth in the local economy, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And I will I will I will show this to you in a little bit why that doesn't matter. Okay. But most of you games can be funded by Microsoft skipping a day of lunch. And a healthy publisher, remember when we are minimizing risk, they're maximizing opportunity. They're on the other end, they have the money, they can take risk. They are companies that are built to take risk, they are risk-taking companies. That's the entire point of their business maximize opportunity spend money to make more money right so they're not looking to minimize their risk no what they're looking for is a promise that your game is going to make them a lot of money right that's what they're looking for so that's what we're going to promise them that's what we're going to sell them here's how we're going to do it within um, before we move there, within maximize risk, of course they're trying to to within maximize opportunity. Of course they're trying to minimize risks. They're not going to take dumb risks, right? They're going to take smart risks. So there's a lot of us. I I hate to say it, but if there's 99 of you watching this right now, the 98 of you are competitors. We're competing. In fact, you're also competing with me, right? If I'm pitching to a publisher and you're pitching to a publisher, I am your competitor. Now, luckily, in the games industry. We don't think of competition as not helping each other. We can be competitors, but still want everybody to succeed, right? So when you think about it, yes, we're competitors, but we're not going to try and make life harder for each other. We're just going to try and do the best job we can, right? So you want to minimize your risks relative to your competition. So when we pitch, it's about communication. It's about communication. And really what we're trying to do, pitching, is we're continuously trying to emphasize our opportunities while de-risking our risks. And by de-risking, I mean explain them in such a way that they don't sound as risky anymore. Right? That is a pitch. Now, think of one more thing. One more thing that is important before we actually get to the pitch. What does the publisher offer that you need? And what do you offer that they need? What is the transaction of pitching a game? Right? What are you getting and what are they getting? And this is one final part. And I've talked about this a little before, but I'm really, I'm going to say it again because I really need you to understand that there's one really big lie that publishers tell us that every publisher tells every developer. And it's a really simple lie. And it's a lie that is so common that we believe it. You believe it. I believed it. I believed it for a very long time. In fact, other indies told me this lie. It's not the publishers that told me this lie. Other indies told me this lie. And I told this lie to other indies. And you tell it to each other because you've heard it from somewhere else. The lie is very simple. The lie is publishers 
don't fund indie games. Publishers do not fund indie games. Everybody tells each other the publishers fund indie games. They don't fund indie games. Publishers are buying something. They're not funding something. They're buying your publishing rights. They're buying the rights to publish your game. And then you fund your game with the money from that transaction. What you're doing is you're selling the rights to your game that gives you profit, but you haven't made the game yet. So now you have to spend some of that profit to make your game. Now that sounds like a small detail, right? That sounds kind of, kind of unimportant, but it is really important. It is really important because it means the amount of money you can get for your game has nothing to do with the amount of money you're going to spend on the game. It has nothing to do with each other. What it has to do, what the only thing it, it, it has to do with is how much you can convince them they're going to make. So let's define some needs. Let's define, um, let's define some needs and the things we need to make this game happen, right? So um, defining needs is basically we're going to talk about what we need to make this game and what we need as a studio. Now this is fairly straightforward. It is fairly straightforward because our needs are basically just people time and money that's it that's what we need now our team fairly straightforward fairly straightforward your team is your designer your artist your coach your sound designer you have the people in production people in marketing qa localization now some of those people are going to work on your team some of those people are going to work on a publisher's team some of those people are internal um, but the short version is everybody kind of knows what kind of people they need, right? Like nothing here is a, is a surprise. Time. Indies are really bad at estimating time. In fact, most of us are really bad. I'm a programmer. I'm the worst. Programmers are the worst at estimating time. If a programmer tells you it's going to take two days, it might take six months. If they say it takes six months, it might take two days. Like programmers are the worst at scheduling time in the history of any video game people, and actually in the history of any people whatsoever, right? I'm like, well, we're terrible. Designers, they're terrible at saying when they start on a job. You tell them, oh, I need this, they'll spend three weeks thinking and then one day working and then they'll be done. And like, it's impossible. It's impossible, right? And then uh, sound, sound people are actually fairly good. Usually when they say it's gonna take this much time, it's gonna take that much time. Artists, they say it'll take this much time, they'll take a little longer. But after they're done, they'll come back three months later and they'll want to make the quality bigger or the quality better and they'll go back to it. And now you have to spend more time on the art. I don't know why they keep doing that. But like the problem with artists is when they make a thing that's better than the previous thing, now they want to make all the previous thing as good as that thing. Always happens. Always happens. Right? So we're terrible at estimating any time whatsoever. For most small indie games, Assume one and a half to two years. One and a half to two years. For bigger indie games, assume two to three years. Right? Two to three years. So that's two, three years of your life. That's how much time you're going to need. To help you with time, really quickly, these are milestones I use in every project I do. In every project I do. Ideation is the part where I'm coming up with ideas. I don't know how long that takes. I have no idea. The prototype, testing my ideas. They usually take a few weeks, right? For vertical slice, I know what I want to make, but I have to prove to myself and to the people around me that I can actually make it. Now, in prototype, I made art mockups. I made sound mockups. I made um, uh, code prototypes. I made design. I, you know, I, I kind of came up with all the individual parts with the loose parts. For the vertical slice, I'm going to put all of it together. That's why we call it the vertical slice. Uh, yeah, Ahmed, a vertical slice, imagine that you have a final video game. Imagine that you have Horizon or God of War. Imagine that you take one tiny slice out of it, one, <clears throat> one level or one dungeon or one area or one fight. We call it a vertical slice because it's, it's a slice of the game. 
So you make one tiny part of the game, but you make it very good. You make it very good, right? So that's a vertical slice. So in the prototyping part, we go fast, we break things, dirty, quick, whatever. For vertical slice, we're going to do is we do it with um, we do a, a, an advanced version of the design of the prototype design prototype right so now you can walk but you can also jump you can also fight and it doesn't have to be final but it has to be in a point where you can kind of see if everything works together so you're going to put some actual art in right like the way it looks in your mock-ups and your target renders you're going to put some actual sound in the way it sounds the way you imagine it sounding you're going to put um uh, some basic shaders in you're going to so it doesn't have to be final, but it has to be clear from the vertical slice that you can make the game that you're promising in your mockups, in your mockup animations, in your um, in your prototypes. When you tell me about your game and then show me the vertical slice, as a publisher, I should be able to look at it and go, "Oh, okay, yeah, I believe you." Then we start on production. Um, so no, it's absolutely not. A prototype but presentable absolutely not it is a prototype a prototype can be just a tiny part of the game it can be just a jump or it can be just a juggle or it can be just one thing prototypes some games have 20 30 prototypes the vertical slice is putting everything together right so it's just testing whether it all works together so the vertical slice is to prove that you can make the game. A vertical slice will be World 1-1 one, one in Super Mario. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And it doesn't even have to be all of World 1-1, one, one, right? It can be World 1-1 one, one until the first green pipe. That's good enough, because that's all there is to Super Mario. Right? You don't need to do the full level. You need to, you need to have enemies. You need to be able to jump on the enemies. You have the little uh, question mark thing, the block. You can hit the question mark block. One of the question mark blocks has a mushroom so you can grow. There's enemies so you can shrink. There's a hole so you can fall. So you don't even need to go all the way to the end of the level. And um, does the vertical slice have to be pretty? It doesn't have to be pretty, but what it does have to be, it does have to make the promise of what the final game is going to look like, it has to make it believable. So if you're believing the prettiest game, the vertical slice needs to be pretty. Come on. Because you need to prove to me that you can do that. Now, if your vertical slice is not the prettiest game in the world, if your game is very mechanics focused, if you're making a, a Roblox, I don't need the game to be pretty. You're not promising to be pretty. Right? But your vertical slice is sort of proof that you can do it. It doesn't have to be final, but I need to look at it and kind of go, like, how long did you take on this? And you say three months, and I'm like, oh, you're going to have two and a half years? Okay, I believe you can do the final game. It's far before a demo. It's far before a demo, but it is sort of like a, a proof. It's a proof to people that you can do what you're going to do. And again, we're not talking to consumers. We're talking to publishers. They see work in progress. They see games that aren't done yet. They see games when it's just cubes and circles. Like they're professionals like us. So you don't have to worry about this being perfect. All you need to do is make sure that when I look at it, I believe it. A vertical slice is less than a demo. A demo is for the audiences. It needs main menus, it needs settings, it needs pause screens, it needs all sorts of st stuff like that. A vertical slice, usually, it starts with a screen with just text on it that says, hey, we're somewhere in the middle of the game. You have a bunch of abilities unlocked. Here's the buttons. Good luck. Right? That's a vertical slice. It doesn't go like, oh, the story of the world or like the prince of whatever. Like, it doesn't do that. No, it's not a demo. It's for, it's for people that are going to check whether you can produce the game, right? After the vertical slice, you should be funded. The vertical slice is right around the time you, you get your funding. So you get funding between prototype and vertical slice. And for first time developers, it'll be closer or right after vertical slice, okay? After vertical slice, you start on production. And production means that the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna implement all the features in the game. And features, I mean features. A lot of people mistake this, but by features, I mean if you're making an RPG and your RPG has items and an inventory, how do you make a feature complete inventory? Well, let me tell you to make a feature complete inventory, you need an inventory screen 
and you need two items in the game. Just two items. Why two items? Well, two items means that I can go up and down in the inventory screen. It means I can use an item and see the other item move up. It means I can delete an item or throw it away. And that's all I need. I need to be able to use an item, delete an item, maybe reorder items. I need to be able to go up and go down. If you want to test multiple pages, you might need five or six items, right? For an old school RPG. So you implement your features with the minimum amount of content, as little content as possible. Some games, this goes very fast. RPGs, this goes very fast because RPGs are very content heavy, but very systems uh, cheap. Very few systems. You usually have attack, defend, uh, item, uh, run away. You have a world map. You can go into buildings, out of buildings. You can load maps, unload maps. You might be able to walk on a world map. Feature complete goes really fast in RPGs because there's not that many systems. It's mostly content, right? The systems are, uh, Ahmed, the systems are the mechanics, the things the game needs to do programmatically. Uh, loading a map, unloading a map, going into a building, exiting a building. Now, when you think about an RPG, the systems, there's not that many systems. But uh, the content, there's lots of content. Every, all the content needs to be made, right? Okay. So when you get feature complete, you switch to going towards content complete. Now, alpha, your feature complete. You take something like... Um, like an RPG, then the time to get from alpha to beta is very long. It's very long because you have to make so much content. If you're making a real-time strategy game, you're not making that much content, right? You have like, what, 20 items? You may, may have like three races, 20, 20 units each, and then you need some level stuff. So the content is fairly quick, right? Now, there is a bit of a confusion because um, a lot of games have content with features. Like Karim is mentioning rogue, roguelikes, RPGs usually have enemies with specific attacks that are different from the main mechanics, right? Those are considered content as well, okay? So feature complete is the main features of the game, the player-based features of the game, and then content is all the non-player-based features of the game. So unique enemy attacks, boss fights, stuff like that, that all counts as content, even though you're still programming, okay? So to alpha is feature complete, to beta is content complete, they do something called a release candidate, which is a version you can send to PlayStation or Xbox or Nintendo, uh, to Apple for certification. Then the company certifies your build and tells you, oh, it's okay, it's good, or it tells you it's not good, you fix it, you do new release candidates until it's good, and then you release your game. This is the schedule I use. Most of the publishers I know use something like this. Now, they might change small details, but I find for developers, this is the best way of thinking about their game because it's very iterative. And it allows you to adjust things as you go. So if you realize that, oh my God, my alpha takes way longer, you can just make less content, right? Because the content is at the end, but the content is the one thing you can adjust easily without breaking the game. If you have to adjust features at the end of the game, you're going to break the entire game. But if you just have to release, uh, remove a level because you don't have time for it anymore, that's much safer. So we go ideas, prototype, quick, dirty, try to get funding, get to the vertical slice, start producing the game. Then we add all the features. After we've added all the features, we add all the content. And then after the content is done, we go towards our release candidate. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. These are relatively industry standard uh, psycho. Um, and then from here, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that each of these steps has a clear deliverable. I've just given you the deliverables, right? These are the good deliverables. And on each of those steps, we need a margin. So however time, much time you think you need, you're going to add additional time, 30%. You think production uh, from production to alpha is going to take you uh, six months, say eight months. Beta to content complete is going to take you a year, say a year and three months. Just add 30% on top. Demand? Just for safety. When you have that, your budget, because you were asking about this, your minimum budget, the amount of money you can make this game for is a comfortable salary for everybody. And by a comfortable salary for everybody you need, I mean not just the people you have on your team now, 
they are also the people you would need to hire to make the game. If you need two additional programmers, add their salaries. Okay? You need five artists, add their salaries. You want outsourcing, add the, add the cost. Add everything up. Comfortable salary. You need to not be poor. You need to be able to go to your parents and tell them that this is a real job. You need to make money. So you put a comfortable salary, not a cheap salary, not a low salary, not a, oh, I can, if I take less salary, maybe the deal is better. No, because like I told you, $360,000 for Microsoft is skipping two sandwiches. Comfortable salary. However much money that is, you multiply that by the amount of months, then on top of the amount of months, you put three months, and then you put that 30% I was talking about, that's that margin, okay? So if you're going to develop for 12 months, you're going to take 15 months and then you put 30% of top of that, right? You add your additional costs and then on the amount of money that, that you get, you put 30% extra money. That's your margin, okay? Now, if everything goes well, you deliver on time and on budget and everything's beautiful, that 30% margin, that's just profit. You just keep the money. Good, buy a car, it's nice. But if, if you don't, okay then you have money to finish the game, okay? Here's the budget ranges. For between 70K and 200K, you're a small indie game. You're a small indie game and we expect development to take no more than two years, preferably one and a half, right? That is with the margins, one and a half. A medium game sits between 300,000 and $3 million, okay? Medium game could take two to two and a half years. For a large game, we're talking about 5 million plus. Now, here's the thing. Without experience, you're not going to be allowed to make a large game. You're going to need very experienced people on your team to make a large game. Okay? Now, these are for PC and console. If you're doing mobile, the numbers go down quite a bit. Right? Numbers go down quite a bit. If you're doing mobile, you're looking at 20K, 25K. But in PC and console, 70K is the lowest number. You know why? Remember what we were talking about, about how publishers look at tripling their money? If I take a 70K game, I need to put a producer on it. I need to put a marketing person on it. I need to put a, um, a writer on it. I probably need to put a tester on it. I put a, need to put a localization person on it. Those people, I have to pay a salary, right? Now, here, here's my, my estimated profit. The 70K of a game, I'm going to give you 70K, then I'm going to make 210K. That's three times as much, right? Now, my profit isn't even $200,000. It's $150,000, not even $150,000. If I take a 300K game, I still put the same people on it, right? Producer, marketing, localization, QA, I put the same people on it, I pay their salary. But a 300K game is going to make me $600,000 revenue because I'm going to give you $300,000, I'm going to earn $900,000, and I'll make $600,000. So under 70K, the amount of profit that tripling the amount of money is going to make is just too low for anybody to care about because they have to pay all these salaries. So under 70K is really hard to get. There's some publishers that do it, and most of those publishers are assholes. They'll steal your money. They'll give you, some, they'll give you very little money at the start. They'll take your game. They'll ship it. They won't care about marketing. Because all they're, they're doing is they're just spending as much as little money on as many games as possible and then hoping that one of them is successful. They don't care about your game. 70 to 200K is the low range, okay? And this is the question some of you were asking about. How do you know whether your budget is, is correct, is viable, is not too low or not too high, okay? What you're going to do, if you're making a game for PC or console, um, you're going to go on Steam and you're going to find three games. Three games that are kind of like your game. They don't have to be exactly like the game. It can be games with the same art style or with the game, uh, a game with the same design or with a similar world or like it just has to be somewhat similar. You're going to find three games and you're going to use something called the box lighter number. The box lighter number changes every time. But um, it is basically, we realize that the amount of reviews a game has is a very clear indication of how many sales a game has. If you take the amount of reviews and you multiply it by about 47 at the moment, you get the amount of units sold, right? So 
you can use Steam Spy as well. Um, I like the box slider number better because it's it's easier for me, but you can use Steam Spy if you want. You're going to find three games that are somewhat similar. You're going to find one game and that budget we just calculated, this budget. We're going to take a game that made 70% of that number. So we're going to take the amount of units they sold, we're going to multiply it by the price, and that number needs to be about 70%. Sure, it can be 60, sure, it can be 80, but somewhere between, let's say, 60 and 80%. Okay, that's game number one. We're going to call that the worst case scenario. Then you're going to find a game that made 130% of that budget. Okay, we're going to find that game, and we're going to call that the break even game. And then we're going to find a game that made 300% of our budget. And we're going to call that our best case scenario. Okay. Here's, here's how simple this is. You take the game that took 70%, you take the worst case scenario, you take the worst case scenario and you compare it to the game that you're promising. And you need to be able to sit there and look your, your, your parents in the eye, look your best friend in the eye, compare the two games and say, our games are clearly better. It's clearly better. And then your best friend needs to agree with you. In fact, your worst enemy needs to agree with you. It needs to be so clear that your game is the better game. You take the 70% game, your game needs to be better. Now we look at the 130% game, right? That 130% game, that needs to be competitive with your game. So it doesn't need to be much better, but it also can't be much worse. You have to look at it and you have to be able to say like, well, you know what? If people can choose between, between these two games, if they get them both on Steam, same price, I don't know which one they're going to pick. They might pick ours. They might pick theirs. I, I think more people will pick our game, but you know, it might, could be either way, right? That's the hundred and thirty percent game. The three hundred percent game needs to be better than your game. You need to look at it and go like, "Oh my god, yeah, well, that's that's you know, that's a pretty good game." I'm not sure. I mean, I obviously, if we do the game really well and you know, we get the funding and we get good marketing, yeah, we could. It's possible, but like, that's a very good game, right? That's how you need to find feel about the three games. The 70% games, you need to laugh at it. The 130% game, you need to look at it and go like, yeah, that's the target. Like slightly better than that, preferably. The 300% game, you need to be like, oh my God, if we could be that successful, that'd be amazing. It needs to not be impossible, but it doesn't need to be guaranteed, right? If those three numbers are correct and those three games are correct, your budget is good. That's it. Your budget is good. If the 70% game is better than your game, you're asking too much money. You're asking too much money. You need to find a way to spend less money or you need to make a different game. If the 300% game is worse than your game, you're not asking enough money. You need to ask more money. Okay? A lot of people, when they try to pitch, they tell people, yeah, Minecraft was right. I don't care that Minecraft was successful. You're not going to make Minecraft. You're not going to make Among Us. You're not going to make Fall Guys. You're not going to make, you're not going to make monster hits. You're not going to make those hits, right? What you're going to do is you're going to take a game 70%, 130%, 300% of your budget. And Ahmed, you know their revenue because with the box slider number or with Steam Spy, you can see the amount of units they've sold. You take the amount of units they've sold and you multiply it by their price. That's their estimated revenue, okay? So you take the amount of units sold and you multiply it by the price. That's the estimated revenue. It's higher than what it actually is, but for this exercise, it works fine. You can factor in sales, but most people don't um, don't factor in sales because it's an approximation. It doesn't have to be exactly right. It just has to be somewhat somewhat correct, right? This is a very crude but effective way of figuring out whether your budget makes sense. If this makes sense, this is very useful information to have. Okay. Now, besides the budget, publishers give you a bunch of other stuff. That's not that's not all that important. Now, we know our budget. We know our timeline. We know what we need. We know how they think. We know what we're making. Now, we need to take our weaknesses, our risks, and de-risk them. Remember, we were talking about emphasizing our opportunities. We've just done that. And now we need to de-risk our risks. So let's look at how you de-risk our risks. Well, first things first, if you're going to pitch, and I beg of you, pitch the final game. Don't pitch your current version. Don't pitch your prototype. Don't pitch your vertical slice. Don't pitch what you have right now. 
you want to pitch the dream, the final version of the game. You're not pitching the team as it is right now. You're pitching the team as it would be with funding, with the people that you would hire if you were funded, right? We pitch the final thing, the final theme, the final game, okay? I don't want to see a single pitch about a protocol. Come on. Let's, let's do some quick fire questions. This is going to be a, a, a bit of an interactive part, okay? Say you've shipped a game before. You've shipped a game. It sold 20 units. It sold 20 units. You shipped it, but it sold 20 units. The reviews are pretty all good. The reviews are pretty good. But it sold, it sold 20 units. Is that a positive or a negative for a publisher? I'm seeing a lot of negative. It's a positive. Here's the thing. Who controls how many people buy a game if the reviews are good? You're marketing, right? Is a developer supposed to be good at marketing? No, a publisher is supposed to be good at marketing. So if you tell a publisher, hey, we made a game. It was really good. We finished it. Right? We're capable of finishing a game. We're capable of taking an idea and making it and shipping it, and the reviews are good, people like it, it's just nobody heard about the game. Because we're not good at marketing, you're good at marketing. Great. Great, that's good enough, right? Shipping a thing is the biggest obstacle that most of you have. Most of you, your biggest risk is you, is the fact that you have never shipped a video game. The reason most publishers are going to say no to your pitch is because you've never shipped anything. So if you've shipped anything, that's a positive. By default, always is shipping anything. Even if it reviews poorly, just shipping it is so valuable. So it's positive. So... You have a budget, you're asking for 150K, but you redo the calculation. We redo the calculation and we realize we're gonna need more money. We're gonna need more money. In fact, um, it seems we are gonna need what? 30K extra money. But you know, we've already asked for 150. What do we do? What do you do? You've already asked for 150, but you do redo the calculations and you realize actually you need 30K more. What are you going to do? You ask for more. Okay, ask for more. That, seemed, that is correct. You ask for more. Now, specifically, you need 30K more. So how much more are we going to ask for? We need 30K extra. How much more are we going to ask for? How much margin did I say? 30 plus 30%, correct. 30 plus 30%. So 30 plus 30% is 40. Right? The amount of money we need plus the margin. You always include the margin. On anything, you include the margin. So that's correct. So you have a team of really capable developers, but they've never shipped a game. They've never shipped the game. And one of the publishers says, hey, we love your game, but you know, none of you have ever shipped and we just, we just, we think it's too risky. How can you fix that risk? How do you fix this risk? So a lot of these answers are really good. A lot of these answers are really good. Prove it with the, the vertical slice, uh, ship a smaller game, find another publisher in to take the risk. Let me give you the answer I would give. The answer I would give is I would ask for more money. I would ask for more money. In fact, I would ask for probably about 100 to 150K extra. I would ask for more money, specifically 100 to 150K extra, because that's the salary for a experienced producer. 
That's the salary range for an experience producer. And then what do I do with that money? Well, I hire an experienced producer. And that experienced producer, that person has shipped the game. And here's the thing, that experienced producer is not going to work for you if they think you can't ship the game. They won't work with you. If they look at it, they can get 100 jobs. So many people need producers. They're only going to work with you if they think that it's going to be worthwhile. Because if they fail a project, that's bad for their reputation. So I increase the budget. I talk to a good producer, somebody who has shipped some games, maybe some games similar to mine. And then I say, hey, listen, if I get the funding, do you want to work with us? And if so, can I put you on the pitch deck? And if they say, yeah, you can put me on the pitch deck. Yeah, I'd love to work with you. Then you just add them to the pitch deck as if they're part of the team already. Because like I said, we pitch the final thing, not the current thing, always the final thing. Right? Good. If you can, you can get a lower budget. You can reduce your budget actually by 30% if you just don't, you spend less money. You don't pay yourself a salary. And you can get 30% lower to be much cheaper. Is that a positive or a negative to the publisher? And Ahmed, I'll answer your question in a second. It's okay, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. Negative. It's absolutely negative. It's absolutely, and it's negative. The honest reason why it's negative is because if you run out of money, you're not going to finish the game. And the biggest risk to me as a publisher, if to anybody as a publisher, is that I give you money and I don't get a game at the end. That's the biggest risk. If you get sick and you can't continue the game because you don't have money, then we're done, right? So having too little money, asking too low is much more dangerous than asking too high. If you ask too low, say, okay, I have a very good idea for how much a game should cost to make, right? I've been doing this for 15 years. I've worked with thousands of developers around the world. I know what a budget should be for a game. I can look at a game and go, okay, that's a $100,000 game. That's a $300,000 game. A lot of publishers have the same feeling because they look at a lot of pitching, right? So say you come in and I look at your game and I think it's a $100,000 game. Okay, I think it's a hundred thousand dollar game, and you pitch to me and you say it's a two hundred thousand dollar game. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna say like, well, listen, beautiful game, um, but isn't two hundred thousand a lot of money for this game? Like, you know, I was thinking more like 100, 120, kind of that range. Like, can you do it for one hundred and twenty? And then you might say, well, you know what? We can look into it. Or you can say like, no, we really need like at least 150. And we're Arabs. You're Arabs. You can negotiate. I don't worry about you being able to negotiate. That's, you're fine. It's going to be good. It's going to be okay. Um, yeah, just exactly. Just pretend we're on the suit and like, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, you can negotiate, right? So as soon as they say 100 and you say 200, you can figure it out, right? Yeah. But <laughs> yes, Eris will be capable of having the publisher end up with 300. I believe it. Anyway, um, really, if you ask for 200 and they think 100, we're just going to negotiate. Now, if they think 100 and you say 50, what do you think is going to happen? They're not going to go like, hey, that's too little. Like, can you ask for more? They're not going to do that. They're just going to look at you and be like, wow, you're bad at business. I don't want to work with you. Because if you're this bad at business, I don't trust you can ship a video game either, right? If somebody wants to sell you a car and they ask for too much money, you're going to negotiate. If somebody wants to sell you a car and they ask way less than you think the car is worth, you're going to think the car is stolen or that it's broken or that it's about to explode, right? You wouldn't trust it. You'd get suspicious. Publishers work the same way. Never ask too low. Too low, much more dangerous than too high. If you're not sure, just ask 50% more, right? If you're not sure, it's fine. Just put 50% on top. Halas done, try that. Okay. In these past questions, and you've gotten really good at it, the trick remains, we maximize the opportunity, we minimize the risk. That's all we've been doing continuously. Ahmed, you asked what the producer is. In a business, um, in, in a business, in a games business, 
there tends to be two people in charge, the creative person and the business person. The creative person, we call them a director, creative director, game director. They're the people that dream and they work with their creative team to figure out what they're making and how they're making it. The business person, that's called a producer, and they work with the creative team to set limits, to set deadlines, to make sure things are going to be on time. Producers in other, in other businesses are called project managers. In games, we call them producers, right? Small boss, they can be the same person, but if they are the same person, that person needs to be very experienced because it's really hard to want something, but then also tell yourself no. That's really hard. And I found that unless the person is really experienced, teams in which the producer and the creative director are the same person tend to fail because there's no accountability. They can't fight with each other. Okay? Cool. So we now have a business case. And the business case is fairly simple. It's the answer to these five questions. Who is making the game? So which opportunity? Why are you making the game? To make what? What are you making? How can you benefit? How's the publisher going to make money? And what do we need? And what do, does the development team need to make it? Who are we? Why are we making this game? What are we making? How are you going to earn money, uh, publisher? And what do we need to make your money? That's the business case. Now, how do you test the business case? Well, you, you, you do it. You pitch it. You pitch. If people say, yes, we're interested, we want to see more, successful. If everybody says no, halos, kill the game, next game. That's why we move fast. That's why we go prototype, we prototype fast, because this is the point where the game dies or lives. And if you take two years getting here and everybody says no, you've burned these two years. They're just gone. And you're never getting them back. You're never getting paid for them. You'll never have had a job that you could have had. You don't have career growth. You don't have anything. You have nothing. We want to get here as fast as possible. So before we get to the vertical slice, we start pitching. And we pitch through the vertical slice if needed, but we're not going to get past the vertical slice without pitching. Okay? So let's talk about the pitch. Let's talk about the pitch. This is the important part. Next time we're back, next time we're back, next time we talk to you, I talk to you, we're going to be talking about a lot of the other stuff of the business. But this time we're going to stop at the pitch. Okay? And Omar, games getting rejected by every publisher after two years of development. That happens to me all the time. So many of the consultancies I get are people that have spent years of their life. And then it's a game about a dog. And publisher, I just say, yeah, no, this year we are not doing games about dogs. It's just not, we don't think that's the market. And then they, they're done. They all have to get a job. The game never gets made, right? It is a shame. It is a waste. If you do it earlier in the process, you can still make adjustments. You can still make, you can still change things, right? But if you spend two years, you're done. You're stuck. You've spent too much time and money. You can't change it anymore. Okay. The pitch. For the pitch, we communicate the business case, we emphasize the opportunities, and we deal risk to risk, right? Everything we just said. Communicate the business case, emphasize the opportunities, de-risk the risks, okay? And it's very simple. We answered those five questions that I said earlier. Who saw which opportunity to make what? How can you benefit? What do we need? So let's go over those questions. The first part in the pitch, you want to prove that you have credibility. You want to prove that you can do this. Now, if you don't have a lot of experience, you just put whatever experience you have, game jams, uh, um, uh, any awards that you might have won, um, any ship things that you might have worked on. If you have any person with more experience, you put them here too. If you hire that experienced producer, you hire them and you put the ship games on there. This is your brag sheet brag about the things you've achieved, right? For the entire team. If your team has already shipped the game, put the game on there. Even if it's not amazing, again, shipping is important. The reason we do this now is because like I said, your biggest risk is you. So let's just get it out of the way. Let's not get them excited and then disappoint them. No, okay, let's try and disappoint them first and then get them excited. It's not your fault that you're disappointing in that way, right? Like you're just starting out. When they listen to a pitch, 
they have no idea what they're going to get. They can get somebody like me with 15 years of experience at five head games, but they can get somebody who's just starting out, right? And obviously, the very experienced developer is more exciting to them. So we're going to start with that disappointment, but we're going to try and make that disappointment as small as possible. We're going to brag as much as we can about what we've achieved so that we start with as little disappointment as possible. Okay? Then we're going to talk about the opportunity. For the opportunity, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to make, we're trying to, to, to tell them a story. And it's a really simple story. The story we're going to be telling them is why this game should exist. And why the team that they're listening to is the right team to make this game. So if you want to make an RTS, you want to make a real-time strategy game, then in the who part of your presentation, you better talk about how everybody on this team loves RTSs and what their favorite RTS is. And then you say, well, you know, in RTSs, we've noticed there's not a lot of real-time strategy games anymore, and we really want to go back to like that nostalgia or whatever. You just make something up, right? But you, you basically say, here's a problem. We believe this is a problem, and we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. And now what is the solution? Well, the solution is your game. That's the solution. Of course, the solution is your game. You've got the problem, and your, your game is the solution. And in this part, you're going to communicate the game. Oh, Omar, does it help if your previous ship games are the same genre, for example? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're building on something that already exists, absolutely that it helps. Because it's helping you prove that you can do it. It proves the who question. When we get to the what part, you're going to explain your game. Please. Please. When you explain your game, Think about this for a moment. Stop thinking about it as a gamer. Because again, the publisher doesn't care. The publisher doesn't care. It's not their job to care about video games. It's their job to find the business cases that will triple their investment. Here's what you need to communicate about your game. What is unique about your game? Right? What is unique? What is special about your game? That's the important part. Why will it stand out? Why should the publisher care? Let me ask you a question. If you go on Steam, right, and uh, you have the bullet points on Steam, and you uh, you want to buy a game, have you ever bought a game because it said, this game has 12 characters? No, right? Who cares? But every bitch... So this game has 12 characters, or the game has 12 levels, or 15 levels, or 30 levels, or whatever. Nobody cares. People pitch, and they think that numbers are something to brag about. But they're not talking about why those numbers matter. I don't want to know that your game has 12 characters. I want to know that your game has various characters with different skill sets that allow players to express their own play style in interesting ways. That's cool. I don't care whether it's five or 12. I just care that players will have different ways of playing the game. That's cool. Right? You think, Ahmed, that sounds like a mobile game, huh? You know why it sounds like a mobile game, huh? Because that shit works. That works. That's why we do it. People don't buy games that say pick one of 12 characters. They pick games where you can do exactly that. Express your own creativity through different characters. Right? The reason we say that kind of stuff is because it just works. And if it wouldn't work, we would stop solving. We would stop saying that. Right? Um, Omar, yes, it is beneficial to say something like X genre with a twist, but tell me what the twist is. A source like with a twist, a source like with an ARPG element, but I need to know what the ARPG element is. What do you mean with source like? What do you mean with the RPG element? Because I can come up with 25 games that fit that description. And uh, some of them are turn based. I can come up with a turn based source like with an ARPG element. Is, are you making a turn based game? Probably not, right? So you want to define what you mean. Now, the second thing that you want to be careful with is that a lot of words that you think mean something mean nothing. Let me tell you something. When I say the word unique, what does that mean? What does the word unique mean? Let me tell you about a unique way to pitch a video game. 
A unique way of punching a video game is punching the person that I'm pitching to in the face. That's unique, very unique. Definitely unique. Is it good? Probably not. You know what's a unique video game to download? A video game that deletes your entire hard drive. Absolutely unique. Good though? No. So unique means nothing. It's useless. It's a useless word. Different means nothing. Special means nothing. All right. You want to know a very simple trick? Take the opposite word. So if you say unique, you might say common or normal or boring, right? You take the opposite, generic, Adam, nailed it. Absolutely, generic. Take the opposite word and think if anybody would pitch their game with that word. Is anybody going to come in and say like, okay, so we have some really mundane mechanics? No, right? Nobody would ever pitch their game. We have some very generic mechanics. No, nobody would ever say that. If nobody would say the opposite, it's not worth saying, okay? That's the rule. If nobody would say the opposite, it's not worth saying. It's only worth saying if you can take the opposite word and you would go like, oh, people would, people would like that, right? So take randomized or procedurally generated. The opposite of procedurally generated is handcrafted. Procedurally generated is done by computer. Handcrafted is done by people. Hand-designed, handmade, human-made. I can pitch a game that's procedural. I can pitch a game that's human-made. Both of those are valid pitches. Okay. It was part of Hollow Knight's pitch and it worked phenomenally well, right? So keep that in mind. Whenever you're using words, especially adjectives, right? A good game, a special something, that, that type of word, the adjectives. If you're using adjectives, always figure out what the opposite is. If nobody would pitch that, then pick a different adjective. Okay. Cool. Then how can you benefit first? How can you benefit part? We've already figured out. Remember the 70%, the 130%, the 300% game? That's this. You just show them. You just show them the proof. At worst, we'll make 70% of your budget. Probably we'll make 130%. And you can absolutely make 300%. Right? Absolutely. And what do we need? Timeline and budget. If you've done this right, we already have this. And this is just the part where you put the timeline and then the budget. So the who is the team? The opportunity is the story. To make what is the game? How can you benefit? Is the comparative analysis we did? And what do we need? Timeline, budget. You put those questions back to back, you make a pitch deck out of that, and you're done. You want to learn to pitch like a human, right? So after you make the presentation, practice it on friends until you can talk about it. Not like a robot, not like you practiced it, but just like a human. Pick a way of talking about your game. Be very objective, be very subjective, talk about the feeling or talk about the mechanics. <clears throat> a very complicated game, be very objective, talk about the mechanics. It's a narrative game, be very subjective, right? Pick a tone, keep that tone. And for everything on your pitch deck, ask yourself the question, and why should you care? And you as the publisher, why would the publisher care about this? 12 characters. Would the publisher care about this? No, the publisher won't care about that. Why should the publisher care about 12 characters? Well, the 12 characters, like the mobile game app, the 12 characters allow the players to pick their own way of playing. Right? That's the reason the publisher might care. Because that means players might replay the game. Right? Omar, very simple. Should you appeal to emotion? This would be fun or awesome? Well, let's try that, right? Fun. What's the opposite of fun? Opposite of fun is unfun. Boring. Nobody would use that. Awesome. What's the opposite of what's the opposite of awesome? Terrible. Nobody would pitch that. So this would be fun or awesome. Terrible sentence for a pitch. Because nobody would say the opposite. So you've basically just wasted everybody's time. Right? So that's important. The important is. And, and notice how that even applies to this simple sentence, right? It's really important that you think about how this communicates and what this communicates to your publisher. And awesome and fun just means that you have nothing more interesting to say about your game, which obviously you're just coming up with an example here. I don't think this is about your game, but for the example, you see how this already applies, right? 
And um, I mean, uh, uh, yes, you can use the backstory when pitching. Usually you do it at the start of the, what are we making? Right. So you kind of tell the story and then you tell about the game. Okay. Now from here, normally you will go to reaching out. We'll talk about that some other time, but this is how a pitch works. So these are the five questions. Who, so which opportunity to make, what, how can you benefit, what do we need? Right? Those are your five questions. Psycho, you can throw sales numbers, but sales numbers mean nothing. You're just guessing. What you can do is you do that comparative analysis, which is uh, this part. This part is better than sales numbers. Because this part you can prove. You can go like, well, you know, this game made this much, this game made this much, we're right in between that. Then you can prove. You can't prove that um, you're going to hit sales numbers. Mohammed, thanks for being here. I also have to go. So, you know, we're we're getting to the end. Um, but, you know, well, the opposite of story driven with multiple endings, I mean, you know, it can be a very mechanical game, but when you say multiple endings, the problem with multiple endings is you're not saying that multiple endings, you're not giving me the advantage of the multiple endings. You have to tell me why people would care about the multiple endings. Are they meaningful? Are they, um, do they do they reflect um, the play style of the player? Are they rewards? Are they punishment? Is it something that will allow replayability? Like, why is it there, right? Because replayable, the opposite of replayable is kind of like, memorable enough that you will only play it once right that's totally fair uh branching linear both of those you could pitch right like greece yeah like uh, greece is linear uh most of us so you tell it in, you tell them in number of sales yeah you tell it by comparable games and showing that right so you don't just throw around sales numbers because, because i can go my new game is going to make a million units I don't know if that's true. I don't know if I can prove it, right? So showing it through this sort of system is a much safer way of doing it. Okay? Tamam. Yo, I have to go. Uh, I am out of time. That's it. If you have any questions, just give them to the program. They'll send them to me, and I'll try and answer them as soon as possible. Um, or if you already are connected to me somewhere on Twitter or LinkedIn or any of those time places, you can reach out there too. If you have a pitch and you want to test it or you want to try it or you want to get feedback on it, it doesn't even have to be a perfect pitch at all. Send it over. I'll take a look at it as part of the program. Um, this is really about how the business of games work. And this is the part that very few people want to talk about openly and want to sort of like discuss. So if you if you want to take that opportunity, feel free. Like I, I am a I am a busy person. A lot of people say that like well, you're a busy person. We don't want to we don't want to um, we don't want to uh, take your time. I'm offering you my time. So please take my take my time, right? Um, and then for the next session, and remind me when is my next session? Uh, it's going to be on August 7th. So 7, 7, and 8, 7, right? Right, seven, eight. right. so in about a month. Um, when we come back, we're, we're going to talk about how you find the publishers, investors, psycho. So we're going to talk about your question. We're going to talk about the business part of it. We're going to talk about uh, negotiations. We're going to talk about those things. In this month, if you want, what I would recommend is if you're working on a project and you work on a project that you want to be commercial, take the information I've given you about prototyping, about uh, um, what the game is going to be. Take everything I've told you and sort of look at it from this perspective as well. So stay creative, stay true to yourself, stay genuine, make things that you care about, but keep looking at what what does this mean from a publishing perspective, from a commercial perspective? Is this something that we can sell? Is this something that we can use in the future, right? Uh, is this something I can talk about in a way that would make other people excited? Think about these things as you prototype. And then next time when we see each other, 
if you have a pitch deck, if you have those ready, if you have something to talk about, we can talk about that during our session, okay? Uh, the more you've done, the more precise my answers can be for your specific case, and that's only valuable to you. So um, good luck. I had a great time. Um, thanks for all the great questions, for everybody who asked questions and for, for playing along when I have questions for you. Um, stay in touch. You can find me on Twitter. I saw they already posted my Twitter um, in the uh, socials, and I'm sure they'll send an email out or something with other places to reach me. Um, stay in touch, and I'll see you next month. Cool. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. If anyone, see ya.